so excited to be with you. I got to confess, I was um, a little surprised when I got the phone call from Monica. She was like, so we have this convention, and I'm well aware from Monica's, my relationship with her. And she said, would you come and share? And I said, OK. She said, we really feel like we need to talk about the mind-body connection. Now, my background. My husband and I worked many years in a faith-based community, and we transitioned in our 40s, and he became a licensed mental health therapist, a drug addictions counselor, and I've, by design, wanted to study mind change work. I'm all about mind change, and I'm about empowerment, not just of myself, but others. And I wanted to know, are there techniques you can undergo or you can use for yourself that will allow you to choose your emotional state? And that sent me on a quest. And let me tell you why. First of all, I grew up in the country and a little east of Gainesville, Florida, north of here. I had a great childhood. All the neighbors knew each other. We grew gardens. We had all kinds of stuff. I had a little Shetland pony that I thought was huge. I rode all the time. I probably climbed trees better than most boys. And one night when I was eight years old, I had my bath. They said their prayers with me, tucked me in. It was like any other night. But that night changed my life. That night, I went into grand mal seizures with no history of epilepsy. No one in my family had a history of epilepsy. And I am several decades ahead of most of you. So this was before. CT scans, MRIs, all those things. When I was eight years, Shan's teaching hospital at the University of Florida literally saved my life. I was hospitalized approximately 10 times when I was eight years old because once the seizures started, they came with a vengeance. I woke up that night in my dad's arms as he was running inside the emergency room. My whole family thought I was dying. My seizures were intense muscle convulsions, eyes rolled back in my head, in danger of swallowing my tongue. There was usually a spoon shoved in my mouth. Lost control of my bladder, and then it took me a good eight hours to recover after one. Now, what I went through doesn't compare to what you're going through, but I've gone through feeling alone. I've gone through feeling scared. I've gone through just, honestly, I didn't know it at the time, but the stages of grief, because that night, my whole childhood stopped to save my life. The pony was sold. I was taken out of scouts, and I was told, you can't play hard enough to break sweat. You try that in Florida at eight years old. And so everything changed. And what I've realized in my life, and there was a deep fear that I would die. I mean, it, they were saving my life. But what I realized as I matured is that fear stayed with me. And then there would get these loops. And the most terrifying thing was I couldn't breathe. So I literally thought I was dying. So the reason I do what I do is because I went on a quest. Because I wanted to know, am I stuck in this fear, sad, angry loop for my life? And I found some amazing things. And is there a mind-body connection? The short answer is yes. I've noticed these slides today. Almost all of them are like, what should you avoid? Somewhere in there is stress. We're going to talk about that a little bit. How do we deal with stress? So this first slide, and now we're about to see if I can walk and chew gum here, because I'm doing it on my laptop, and I'm doing it here. OK. Nope. There? OK, what am I doing wrong? You have a clicker. Where's the clicker? I thought I'd push the button. Oh, is it here? OK, green. Green is go. Yes, thank you. All right, in 1949, Donald Hebb, a neuropsychologist, said neurons that fire together wire together. 
He used this phrase to describe how pathways in the brain are forced and reinforced through repetition. All right, think a little kid learning to tie their shoes. So what this man believed is that in your brain there's neurons that fire together the more you have the same thought or the more you're learning a behavior. So if a little child is learning, they'll be like, make the bunny ear, make the other bunny. It's a very conscious, conscious learning. After a repetition, more neurons have fired. And then we call it conscious, unconscious. OK, make the bunny ear, and then shh, it's done. Then it goes into what we call unconscious, unconscious learning. This child can tie their shoes and not think about it. And so what we've realized, there's a few things they've realized about the brain. One, you can learn well into old age, which I'm personally really excited about. Sorry. Um, but we've also learned this applies to emotions. And it applies to thoughts. And so when you're having the same repetitive thought, neurons are firing and wiring together. You tracking me? OK, good or bad? So if something really scares you and you're like, I'm going to die and that's your response every time, you're firing more neurons. And after a while, your brain will take you to that negative place without you even being aware of it. Now, when you're in the middle of a medical episode, what are we? We're stressed to the max, aren't we? And we're trying to avoid stress, and we're trying to feel like, OK, I know I need to do this. And so I went on this quest to find out, is there brain processes we can do? Are there cognitive processes we can do to calm the body down? And is there a way to train the brain to think of the emotional state we want while we go through the hardest thing in our life? That's where I'm coming from. Now, let's, so I'm about to talk about something that some of you, your eyes are going to roll back in your head, but I'm asking you to stay with me. I'm taking you somewhere. And it's, a, it's one positive mental state that they've done some studies on. And let's look at it. And that is gratitude. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve their health. What? Gratitude? Think about that for a second. Deal with adversity. Ah, that procedure coming up. And build strong relationships. How does gratitude improve your health? Studies have shown, this is a Mayo Clinic, that feeling thankful can improve your sleep, your mood, your immunity. Think about that for a second. Gratitude can decrease depression, anxiety, difficulties with chronic pain, and risk of disease. If a pill could do this, everyone would be taking it. Let me tell you, if one of the pharmaceutical reps came up to me here and said, if you take this, it will do all of this with no side effects, I would be like, how much and where do I sign up? And we all would. And so we're quick to dismiss that, wow, if I move my thoughts a certain way, it could improve my health. Now, here's the kicker with that. Some of us have trauma. We have real trauma from the medical procedures we've had to go through. I was one of them. Now, I'm grateful because it saved my life. But when you go through things like that, it has. And we may need some trauma work. And that's where mind work comes in. I've actually, I'm standing here because I've done my own work with myself and other people. All right. In short, gratitude can boost the neurotransmitter serotonin and activate the brainstem to produce dopamine. Dopamine is your brain's pleasure chemical. Recently, I was going through something really, really challenging emotionally. And I was like, girl, you need to practice what you preach. And so I started really focusing my attention on this principle. And all of a sudden, I shifted. I shifted mentally, and I shifted physically. It was amazing. Um, Studies have shown that regular gratitude practices, specifically through journaling, will actually shift your brain's behavior to have a more positive outlook. When you're in fight or flight, high stress mode, you, first of all, you're not designed to be in it very long. But secondly, your immune system is suppressed. Your digestive system is suppressed. I've sat in these amazing talks 
and really listened. And I'm like, wow, could we come alongside and assist you so that as much as possible, you're boosting yourself, you're taking yourself out of fight or flight into rest, relax, creative state. Okay, here's my training. Your thoughts create your feelings. So, good or bad? Most of us aren't even aware throughout our day what we're thinking about. We have so many thoughts going through our mind. Most of us are either in the past or in the present. If we're in the past, it's a lot of times stressful. If we're in the present, we're fortune telling, and we're usually lousy fortune tellers. We're anticipating things that, oh, this is gonna be bad. Your thoughts create your feelings. Your feelings will create your behaviors. Your behaviors then create your habits. And well, then your habits create your quality of life. So I would encourage you to really think about the next few days, just begin to notice your thoughts. Where are they? What are they on? And again, realistically, working through a very challenging event. But at the same time, okay, where are my thoughts? I was thinking about all of you in in preparation for this time. You live in such a great time, because these physicians have so much knowledge they didn't have 40 years ago. It's amazing. It's amazing, frankly, with AI, we don't know what they'll discover in the next few years. And so even that, while you deal with reality, like, wow, there's a lot of hope here. So that's my training. Now, let's talk mind change. I've got certifications, hypnosis, clinical medical support, Comfortable childbirth, uh, neuro-linguistic programming, and some you've never heard of. Because again, I'm on a quest. I want tools. I want tools for myself. I want tools for others. And you know, this is the technical definition, a trance-like state in which a person becomes more aware and focused on thoughts, feelings, images, and sensations and behaviors. If you've ever been in flow, if you're in the job, And I mean, you are just in flow. You've got this project, you're really into it, and it's just, you know, you can hear the sounds, but you're just dialed in. Or athletes call it the zone, where every shot goes in. And if you watch sports and you watch an athlete's eyes, you'll usually see when they go into it. But if you've ever been in that, you've been in a trance-like state. It's a natural state that we can go in and out of. Personally, I learned hypnosis using self-hypnosis. A vice president of my company suggested, you need to buy a book, I think it could really help you. And so I did, and I corrected my sleep right away. (laughs) And I was like, oh, oh, and I corrected a few other things, and then I got really curious. Self-hypnosis is fabulous for, there are people in this room that use hypnotic techniques for pain control. They can't take pain medication, and they've been taught not by me, but by other great people, how to reduce their pain using their mind. And if you think, well, what if I couldn't get it to zero? Well, what if you could get it from seven down to four or five using your mind? Would that be encouraging? You see where I'm going with this. Um, Okay, still good. I'm not great on time, so I'm trying to be cognizant. So a few years ago, my husband was in a major accident, motorcycle accident, broke five bones, I was at the ER with him, (laughs) and they couldn't give him any pain meds because they hadn't done the CT scan yet, and they had to wait for that. And my husband looked at me, he goes, San, San, I need you to do your cool mind tricks on me, San. (laughs) And I was like, okay. And that's exactly what we did, and that's how he got through. Because he was having, he was, his breathing was labored. The lung was starting unknown to us. You can train the brain to do that. You can train the brain. What if you learned cognitive skills and and hypnotic skills to decrease anxiety? I do that all the time. I have a lot of anxious people that come see me, and I'm like, okay, imagine this is gone. What do you want to feel? And they all get a little mad at me, and they're like, to not be anxious, like this. And I'm like, you just told me what you don't want to feel. If the anxiety was gone, who's there? What would you want to feel? And they're like, nobody's ever asked me that. I'm like, I know. That's why we're talking. But what if you could? Because some of us are. 
So then, so with hypnosis, I personally utilize it all the time. If I have a deeper issue when I did my trauma work, some of it from childhood, and I had, frankly, some of it in adulthood, um, I needed to go see someone that, that could guide me through that. That was just me, just being very honest and real with you. So that's hypnosis, just a, a very small thing. I could do a whole day on hypnosis and take you in and out of group trance and stuff, but we, have, we need to be cognizant of time. And then there's mindfulness. You hear about this all the time. Google it. Mindfulness. Did I get to? Ah, there we go. Mindfulness is a technique in which one focuses one's full attention only on the present, experiencing thoughts, feelings, sensations, but not judging them. The practice of mindfulness can reduce stress and physical pain. We're back to using the mind to reduce our stress and physical pain. Mindfulness is very simple and very fast. Um, check this out. Start with one minute. Most of us could find a minute, couldn't we? You sit comfortably, feet on the floor if possible, hands on your lap. Now, I would say with that, the main thing is that the body's stable. So if you're at a table, you might want your hands on the table. Don't necessarily do this if you're sitting at a kitchen bar stool. You just want to be very stable. You take a nice breath in, and if it's comfortable, exhale a second or two slower than you inhale. That actually has a calming effect on the central nervous system. And then as you breathe, just be aware of your breath as it goes in and as it goes out. And then you just are aware of any thoughts that go through your mind, suspending judgment. And then you just notice any feelings in your body. Most of us aren't really connected with our bodies the way we think we are. And again, just suspending judgment. Be okay with it. And just focus on this moment now. That's it for one minute. Would you like to practice that now? Show of hands. If you don't want to, you don't have to. <laughs> You're already doing it. I love it. OK, we don't need to then. OK, thank you. Um, that's mindfulness. And by the way, with that, when you do it, if you will add gratitude at the end, and as long as you feel the gratitude is what you're looking for. Yeah. OK. So what I'm come to tell you today is that there's so many possibilities to use your mind to create the emotional state you desire while you go through a really challenging time. We're seeing this over and over with clients. I wish someone had told me that. And I want to close with a true story. So I was taking a continuing education class, and the instructor is a licensed mental health counselor, a hypnotherapist. And at the time, his office was in Seattle, Washington. And he said, the docs refer to me people in chronic pain and people that are dying. They're terminal. And he said, when they come to my office, I tell them, I can't change your diagnosis. And they're like, we know. He said, but what if I could teach you a technique that could reduce your pain? Or as you near the death phase of your life, as you end your life, you could choose the emotional state you want. And almost all of them were like, yeah. And he had one woman who was terminal. Her husband always brought her. And she really attached to this process. Here's the process. You pick no more than two sentences, one to two sentences, of the greatest expression of yourself. Think you on your best day. Think you with your beloved pet, a puppy, an animal. Think you with someone that you love very much, with a grandbaby. The best version of you, whatever that is for you, are all unique. And then the process is he has them tape it to the bathroom mirror because he believes you can brush your teeth and meditate at the same time. So when it's time to brush their teeth, they think of one thing they're grateful for, and they feel feelings of gratitude, and then they start reading their sentence and really rehearse, how am I going to be this way when I leave this room, when I go to breakfast with my family, 
When I'm in traffic, that one always is hard for me. When I, in that meeting, how am I going to be this version? <coughs> Midday, he has them think about the rest of their day and really rehearse being the best version of them. At night, he has them ask, where did I do really well? And acknowledge that. And then say, where did I fall from grace? And with wherever they fell from grace, and I have a lot of anxious people, I only let them choose one. I've got some people that be up all night. Um, choose one and just say, if I had that one moment to live over as the best expression of myself, what would I do differently? And that's it. Go to bed, next morning repeat. That's it. The people in pain reduce pain levels go down. And he had this lovely lady who was dying. And he had a satellite office where he had to take a ferry, and the phone rang, and it was her husband. And he said, I need to cancel Tuesday's appointment. And he said, oh, OK, you want to reschedule? And there's silence. And he goes, I'm so sorry. I didn't know she was this close. And the husband quietly said, it's OK. We're all here. It's very peaceful. And then the husband quietly said, but she's asking to see you. And this showed me what an honorable guy this guy is. He said, tell your wife I need to cancel every appointment on my books. I need to catch a ferry, but I'm on my way. And that's what he did. He got there. She was in coma. He visited with the family. He went by the bed, and he was just stroking her hand. She came out of coma. And she looked at him with a big smile on her face and said, this hurts like? And I'll let you fill in the blank. And then she looked in his eyes and smiled and said, but I'm OK, and I'm going to be OK. And then she looked deeply in his eyes again and said, I just wanted to thank you. I just wanted to thank you. Folks, what we've learned is that we can train the brain to choose our emotional state even in death. Think about that for a second. Because if I can choose it in death, what can I do in life? What could I do? To, to change and enhance my treatment just from my mental state? What could I learn? And that's really what I came to say today, that there is a mind-body connection. And it doesn't take five hours of meditation, but if you want to do that, do that. That's, that's good for you. But it's something that can change even our mental state when we're going through treatment. Even our mental state as we come out of an episode. We can train the brain. So I just really came today to inform and give you some hope about that, that, wow, I can really take hold of this. Now, I know that some of you are like, I think I get emotional with episodes. And that's where we have to talk to the doctor and figure that out. But even then, as we go through that, we could be bringing the brain back. OK, how am I? Oh, I'm doing well. Now. If you choose, if you want to do these processes, if you will email the board, I will get them to you and give you instructions with how to do it. But it's totally up to you. But what I do want to say is if, as I stand here, I thought, when Monica invited me, I thought, I have to go. Because people like you are my heroes, that you show up. You're here. It's like, I want to learn about this. I want to help my child. I want to help me. I want to help my family. And so with that, really start to notice your thoughts. When I really started noticing my thoughts, I was like, wow, I live a lot in the past and a lot in the future. What did that mean? I'm missing this moment now, aren't I? I'm so busy trying to anticipate and control. And it was fear-based. It was just fear-based. So I want to go through just quickly with you. Here, Monica said, can you give some suggested reading? And I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> because this is, uh, this is my take on it. The brain that changes itself. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, many years ago, PBS did a, uh, a special on this with this man. And this was before we discovered neuroplasticity. But it's real life cases of people, and they had very unusual brain situations and how they overcame. One of my neighbors, she was asking me about books, and I said, I really love that book, and she just read it. She goes, oh my gosh, it's really helped me. The next one is for those of you um, who spiritually are interested in the brain and God and all that. 
fingerprints of God. This lady started her belief system believing it was wrong to take an aspirin and uh, completely went the other way, but it's her journey. And one of the chapters she talks, she wanted to know how science fit into this, the God thing. And she talks, people who pray and meditate for long periods of time to, to hook up to machines and get their brain scanned while they were doing it. Because um, she really wanted to see that. So if you ever have that tension or have had that question. Dr. Amen, change your brain, change your life. I like this because he uses spec scans and he will show you a scan before, and he'll show you a scan after treatment. He uses pharmaceutical, sometimes supplements, counseling, and sometimes hypnosis. And he treats a little bit of everything from a mental health perspective. He's a psychiatrist. The late Dr. Sarno, the mind-body prescription, he ran a pain clinic and was getting really depressed because he didn't see a lot of great changes in people. And he started really reviewing their scans and realizing they shouldn't be having pain right there. And something didn't make sense to him, and he started seeing the emotional component, and that was his thing. This next book, The Anti-Anxiety Toolkit, this is from my wheelhouse. If you struggle with anxiety and you want what my husband calls cool mind hacks, this is a fun little book. Read it with your family and practice. You won't like all of them, but you will like some of them. I teach these to people that come to see me, a variation of them. And then, keeping the brain in mind, the same woman who wrote the one before, Melissa Tears and Sean Carson. This is more for coaches, therapists, and hypnosis practitioners. It's neuroscience. But I hope this has been beneficial for you. About hypnosis, you, I'm trying to think of what I'm asked a lot, since I have a few minutes. It's not mind control. You won't do anything you're morally opposed to. How Vegas works <laughs> is usually when there's an attitude of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas and a lot of alcohol and a few drugs, you might do some outrageous things. But I was at a Vegas show and I saw a woman refuse to do something he told her to do. He wanted her to cuss her husband out while she was in trance. She wouldn't do it. And he got really nervous, this entertainer, and he moved on. It's not truth serum. You won't tell your deep, dark secrets. And a good hypnotist, we really don't want to know. Um, <laughs> we hear a lot already. We don't want to know. Um, I mean, truthfully, it's not. Um, it is not you surrendering. It's you in agreement with it. That this is my goal. This is what I want to work on. And accomplishing that goal. If you are wanting to start on your own, Again, email the board. If you want instructions like, how could I just easily do self-hypnosis just to see for yourself? Email them. I'll send you some instructions. I don't mind. But whatever you do, I wanted to pique your curiosity today. Do your own research. Maybe I follow a guy on Instagram that's really into Qigong and meditation. And I'm like, you know, I might go there before it's over with. I like what he's saying. Find your own thing. But no, you don't have to be a prisoner to what's happening to you. And I wish someone had told me that in the 10 years I was in treatment. Because it very much felt that way. It felt like I'm just holding on, you know? I'm just holding on. And as a kid, as a middle schooler, when you know your hospital hall's better, then your school, there's a lot of emotions, a lot of grief with that. So I hope this has helped you. We got 55 seconds, but I'm gonna wrap it up here. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, it looks like it. All right, um, thank you so much. And we'll have questions for Sandy and I, I believe on our, and it looks like it's happening. Dr. Cannon's gonna come up as well. And so maybe they'll uh, join forces and kind of put the pieces together for, Thanks, you for any questions that you have. <laughs> so feel free to write them down or come on up. Um, there was one that came in very early, Sandy, in your talk. And it says, do you have any recommendations for a specific CD uh, for our, HPP, that would be, be very specific, <laughs> or just a really good CD for difficult health conditions? I think there's several out there. 
I think it would depend on the person. If you are struggling with high anxiety, I would find someone who's certified in clinical medical support hypnosis and get one of theirs. I've actually been thinking about this group and I'm, I'm toying with the idea of creating some specifically for this, but if there's an interest, but I, I think what you want is to really define what my need is. Like, first and foremost, am I really, really anxious? And do I need to work through that? When I, I had an injury about five or six years ago and I listened to some things and I just focused on boosting the immune system and I focused on my brain being calm and taking me as much as possible alongside the people who were treating me. And that's very therapeutic for you. So that would be my answer to that. Okay, very good. Well, you have a lot of questions. So let's okay. <laughs> start working through them. Um, what would you say to a, I'll try to do them pre to post. How about that? What would you say to a person that is skeptical about their ability to be hypnotized? I would say that's great. <laughs> I don't think, I am not a person that just because you tell me something, I believe it. Not everyone, you should know, studies have shown not everyone can be hypnotized. So I would suggest listen to a CD and see, or buy a book, or read a podcast, or listen to a podcast about self-hypnosis yourself. Basically, hypnosis, we've got conscious mind, subconscious mind. You relax the mind and the body, especially with therapeutic hypnosis so that you have access, so that the conscious think, conscious, subconscious are in, a, in communion, in agreement, in the same page. So I think that's okay. I think that though you should explore it, because the people that have come into my office and said, I don't think you can hypnotize me, but I'm here because I really need some help, um, a lot of times they go the deepest. It's really interesting. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, let's just see. You know, it's like, we'll just try and see. How can uh, hypnosis help me with anxiety? In so many ways. <laughs> um, one, we can figure out really what, there's specifics about anxiety I would ask you if you came to see me. Like, people come to see me and they're like, I'm really anxious. And I'm like, okay, I hear that. Um, let me ask you, where do you first feel it in your body? How do you know you're anxious? And they're like, what? And I'm like, how do you know? And I don't want to know. I said, I want to know progressively. Where does it start? Because what I found with some people, it starts in the gut. And then it moves up. And there's this, in the gut it might be a fire. In the gut it might be just tension. And then usually a lot of times it will explode into racing thoughts. Other people, not so much. It starts in their hand. And then it'll be something else. So notice your anxiety. Then you can do hypnosis to release that. And also what I referred to earlier, like, okay, when the anxiety is gone, how do we want to deal with that situation? When you go into that procedure that makes you so anxious, how do you want to be? And that's where hypnosis is fabulous. It's fabulous for goal setting. And that would be considered a goal. I'm in if they're, I'm, no, no, okay. I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> you related. Um, I appreciate how, that. How would I go about hypnosis if I have anxiety about not being able to achieve a hypnotic state? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. I think what you want to do is realize the greatest changes come when we walk through fear and see what's on the other side. And it might be something wonderful, or it might be, oh man, this isn't my cup of tea, but at least I gave it a shot. And I think with that, but that person, I would say, they need to see someone that is also trained, that, that's worked with a lot of anxious people and would really help them. How can I change my negative thoughts? Ooh, we could do an all day session on that. Um, the technique I taught you is one of them today. But I think first and foremost, recognizing your negative thought. So if you're, if you're prone to negative thoughts, that means the neurons have fired and wired together. And so possibly at a subconscious level, you're just being pulled there. So then you figure out no more than two sentences, like, okay, instead of the negative thought, and please don't be a Pollyanna. Like, 
oh, everything's just fine. I'm, I'm not struggling at all. We, we have to deal with real life. Like, this is a hard situation. But every day I'm learning more. And every day I'm calmer. Or whatever the resource state is you want, you counteract that negative thought with it. Initially, you should know, when I took this training, if you do this, there's a little period of withdrawal because so many neurons have fired together. And my hand went up in class. And he's like, yeah. I said, how long does withdrawal last? Because <laughs> and we all laugh. And he goes, it's different for everybody. But I can tell you, if they will stick with that, eventually that will fall off. And they will have the desired state they want. OK, yes? I think you're talking a little bit about this. But the question is, what are the side effects? Or are there side effects with hypnosis? Deep relaxation <laughs> is one. Um, <laughs> uh, I think also uh, when you do deeper work, uh, when I've let go of trauma, for instance, I might be tired. I might want to nap that day because you're doing some neurological work. And um, so you might need that. Uh, most people feel pretty nice afterwards. <laughs> you can ask Monica. She's came to see me. She'll, she'll, you can tell them good and bad. Um, but yeah, that's mainly it. Um, a well-trained hypnotist, if you're doing therapeutic work, if there's something that you come up against, a fear that you're not ready to deal with, you will know. And they will not make you go through that. You should know that. That this is your change. And so if you do have something like that, that simply tends to, oops, sorry, that simply tends to mean I'm not ready to make that particular change about that issue. The good news is you can get ready as you do mind work. Mindfulness uh, or living in the moment without distraction seems to have a parallel with Buddhism. Do you find that certain societies or sects handle anxiety better than others? Well, um, I've traveled, but I really haven't traveled to India. <laughs> I think if you are trained as a young child to use mindfulness, and, and I'm really excited in some of our schools in the United States now, they've, taught, they've started to teach mindfulness at a young age. It's, I think it's important. I do think you might have the ability to handle things better, actually, because you would understand from an early age, I can control more of my thoughts than I realized. And these two seem to be related. How can I find a good hypnotist in my area? And can hypnosis be done virtually? I think, first of all, in your area, you want to, re you want to really think about what you want to utilize hypnosis for. And when you call the person, and I've had people call and ask me this, and I appreciate it. They're like, I have this issue. Have you ever worked with anyone with this issue? And I'll be really honest with them if I haven't. Um, that would be the first thing. And if they don't have a training in that, I wouldn't use them. I'm not going to tell you to do something I wouldn't do. I wouldn't use them myself. I'm particular about who I do hypnosis with. Um, yes, you can do hypnosis online. You can do hypnosis virtually. And especially with COVID, a lot of us have done that. So you can do hypnosis online. People vary. Many people like to come in, to be physically there. There's a bit of an exchange of energy. But a lot of people are like, no, I went really deep, and I made that change, and it was really good. You can also, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, um, I used to lead um, group hypnosis at a drug and alcohol recovery center. And you can also, if you find hypnosis groups, and that's the other thing I had thought about for this group, is seeing if there was an interest later. But again, if there's not, that's fine. But you, there can be a lot of benefit to that, where you pick a topic like anxiety to calm, and you spend a month, and you're not just using hypnosis, but you're taught cognitive skills, and you practice them every week, that kind of thing. So it can really be, so there's a lot of creative things you can do. Yes, sir. I found it interesting that you have to feel, and that's the emphasized word, feel the gratitude. How do you sincerely feel gratitude if you're stuck in negative thought loop, in a negative thought loop in your subconscious? Well, that's a really good question, isn't it? The issue there is, if I were you, I would not make this feeling of gratitude about the meaning of life, all right? 
It can be something as simple as your comfortable shoes on your feet. Thank you, God. These shoes are so comfortable today. I'm really, I feel that. And just keep telling, whatever it is you're feeling grateful, you're deciding. We want to take it from the intellectual and move it into the body. That's why we're doing that. And so just keep saying, I'm just really grateful. Now, initially, it may be that you only feel a flicker if that, but keep at it and the feelings will come. It's just you're, you're training your brain to do something new. Think about it. If you haven't gone to the gym in a year and you get on something, man, <laughs> it's, your body's going, uh-uh, we don't usually do this. That's what your brain's doing. You're training it. Mason, hey, so maybe uh, I have one question if we have time. It's a previous group, periodic paralysis. Uh -huh. So you mentioned it resonated with me. <clears throat> Fear in the future and anxiety because of lack of control is a very strong, bio it grows across species. And I've heard from many of our friends here that one of the worst things is you just don't know. Next week or tomorrow, how is my boss, my friend, my spouse going to understand that I can't show up? Right. And then you get anxious about that, and then your stress levels, adrenaline goes up, hypo PP, you have a big attack, a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So these tech, this is extremely important for this, I think, and, and wonderful opportunity for that. Thank you. And that would be what you just described. I would describe that as fortune telling. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a lousy fortune teller. When I'm stressed like that, it's like, everyone's going to leave me. Oh my gosh. There's no evidence of that in the present right? <laughs> it's like, okay. Or what if I have another episode? My biggest fear when I had epilepsy was having a seizure, because I mean, I had rough seizures, was having one in front of the whole school. I've had one in class. And it was terrifying. And so I, please don't think I'm minimizing your fear. But what I'm saying is, we have to learn how to harness that in, that like, oops, there I go in the future again. Let me look at today. Today I'm not having an episode, and that's a good day. Or today I just recovered, and I'm at this conference, and yeah, I had to go rest, but I've been surrounded by people who care, and I've been surrounded by new knowledge. What a great place to be. See, that's staying in the moment and not allowing yourself to go there. And that's what I mean about the, the past and the fortune telling in the future. And it will change, but listen, I'm just like all of you. If something, if I'm worried about something, and, I, and by the way, one of the definitions of worry is mental torture. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the definitions. If your child said, mommy, I'm just going to go in the bedroom and mentally torture myself. <laughs> you feel like, you need to sit down. <laughs> we got to talk. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't allow that. And so it's about realizing we have a lot more control than we thought. If you would like to know more about periodic paralysis, visit periodicparalysis.org. And if you enjoyed this video and want more, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell so you don't miss any future videos. It really does help spread the word. You can view other videos about periodic paralysis by clicking the thumbnails to the right. If you have questions, just leave a comment below or reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you.